This episode of Dr. Drew After Dark is brought to you by Care Of and Calm, our sponsors, but uh, I will tell you a little more about that later. Now, the show. Hi, I'm Dr. Drew, and this is Dr. Drew After Dark. Please be advised that Dr. Drew After Dark may contain sexually oriented content and be unsuitable for young children. And welcome to another episode of Dr. After Dark. Of course, you can uh, send your emails in at drafterdark at gmail.com. Also, the voice messages at 818-253-1693. We appreciate all the support. I'm going to ask two things of the audience at the beginning. One is check support the people that support this podcast. Like these guys that make these watches, these Vincero guys, we only have great advertisers here. We choose them very carefully and they allow this all to happen. So please support them. We appreciate that. Also check out my website, drdrew.com and the Dr. Drew podcast. I need your support over there. That is a little bit, shall we say, a straighter podcast, right? They're, they're already laughing in the back. Let's, and I don't mean straight in the sense of sexual orientation. I mean, there aren't people fucking with me all the time as there are here. So with that said, let me introduce the great Pete Holmes. It's a pleasure to have you, my friend. It's wonderful and, to be here. And speaking of people screwing with me, we, before the mics heated up, you were already on me. Well, a little bit. I didn't know that that was the theme of the show, though. So it I, is, I I'm not sure it's what it feels like. I'm not sure it's the actual theme of the show. So. Well, you know, maybe it's because I knew I was going to be talking with you, and I love to see you. You as well. And uh, Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I had a wonderful birthday. And I pulled in, uh, and they said you were running late, and I started to think, why? I, I know where you live, and I know where we are now. I, I've been doing radio in Culver City all afternoon. And then you were doing radio. Yeah. So I quickly diagnosed. I don't know if it's because I was going to talk Please. to you. Or if it's just what I do. Please. I thought to myself, Dr. Drew could record this at his house. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But he... Nadav, you listening? Does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pete, stop giving him ideas. You could. Keep going, yeah. And then I was like, and this is, I think I'm wrong. Go ahead. But I just had this thought. I was like, I wonder if he doesn't like, uh, he wants his day full. He likes driving ah, someplace uh, and doing something and then driving someplace he, else. I, I like my day full. I do not like driving. I yeah. like doing. I like the great opportunities I've had to do things like this. I, yeah. really, I find them very rewarding to try to make But you don't like driving. I do not like driving. And, and not. <laughs> I don't. LA just drives me crazy. But what you're zeroing in on is my codependency and my low self-esteem, which you and I have kind of talked a little bit about. A little bit on my yeah, podcast. On your yeah. podcast. Well, uh, I was wondering because well, I, I... yeah. Well, hold on. Where can we ahead. find your podcast? Please. What's that? Where can we find your podcast? Oh, it's, it's on, on iTunes. You made it weird. Or anywhere. You can find it. You made it weird. Just type in you made it weird. Okay. Fine. Listen yeah. anywhere. All right. And Pete and I did a long podcast and it was and a little weird. Was, listen to it that. Was, it was a little weird. It was great because I had taken uh, Adderall that day. Oh, I thought it was mushrooms that day. No. No, that no. was the Adderall day. Right, Adderall. Right, right. Although I told you that Adderall felt mushroomy too. Oh, me. Duncan came on this show. Just hey, man! <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, yeah, the Duncan might have been on mushrooms. Was well, he? Usually. A microdose? So Is just, he though? This, you, the three no, of us had dinner and I called him a coward because he's usually, as a joke. Because he's usually the one that's pushing me to do stuff, and he's saying that now that he's older, he's doing. Less he's worried less. about, it, and he's very respectful of the whole process. Which I is am what too. I like about him, yeah. I'm actually worse. If that's bad, I'm worse. If that's good, I'm better. Yes, you're you're better. I'm very very deliberate about my use of. But, but mine is I have low self esteem, yeah. and I'm codependent. It turns out that esteem is something that's set at about age five. Yeah, that's what. It, yeah, I was wondering. And, and mine was low. Yeah. And it remains low, but it doesn't bother me. In other words, it's just you're either up or you're down. Yeah. And if if it's low and it bothers you, you make it feel dim- I don't feel diminished. Right. I just always put myself second. Or, and you're or, okay with it. And I'm, I'm cool with it. And I right. and I know I do this. And it's yeah. I and I don't come to my own aid the way I should because I'm not. And also where it gets to be a problem. Yeah. I'll tell you where it gets bad. Is where you ever heard of the Dunning Kruger effect? I think maybe yeah. tell me what it so is. So Dunning Kruger is two doc, two psychologists that t- describe this phenomenon that allows people to get up and like say at American Idol and sing like shit uh-huh. and say, I'm, "Isn't that great?" Oh, it's, it's called the comedian effect. It, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every comedian I know ha- has to have the Dunning Kruger. Okay, effect at so, the beginning, right? So Dunning Kruger is you, you have a cognitive distortion where you think you're you're doing something awful, but you think it's good. We call it laughter ears. Laughter ears. Yeah, like that guy's laugh- got laughter ears. Interesting. He bombed, but he has laughter ears. He thinks he heard he heard a little him. laughter in there. But it's weird because you do have to have that a little bit. It's a Mike Birbiglia quote where he's like, a comedian has to be a little bit delusional because you have to go up night after night, do badly, and say, I think that went pretty well. <laughs> And you have to, because you're going to be bad at the, at the beginning. Well, not just the beginning, but everybody has a bad night, even totally. when they're good. I still do it. Yeah. 
See, it's funny because you're talking about how your dysfunction, if we yeah. want to call it that, serves you. Yeah. In fact, it makes you kind of a sweet, nice guy. Well, it makes me, it helps me care for other people. And it's, so it's beneficial in two ways. Yeah. I would say it's beneficial because people think you're a sweet, nice guy and it helps you help other people yeah. be, and give. Yeah. And it's and nice give. to give. It makes yeah, you yeah. feel good and, and it's also nice to give. Um, I'm a big believer in that. I lean into my dysfunctions. Mm -hmm. So I identify them and then sort of try to like turn them into um, superpowers. You know, every superhero story is like yeah. something bad happens to them oh, so and gonna, then they use that to become you're super. You're gonna tell me what that is in a second. Let me finish my Dunning-Kruger thing and say that yeah. I have the opposite of the Dunning-Kruger, which is the imposter effect. We talked is, about this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in showbiz have the imposter. Which is, I, I know a lot of stuff, but I feel like I know nothing, or I feel like an imposter. And because, because it's me that knows all these things, mm. I feel like it should be easy for anybody. I get it. Right, because I'm low self-esteem, so it's like, I, I got to figure it out. So everybody else should, and then that comes off as arrogant. Did you marry somebody that tells you that you're special, I hope? No. <laughs> Are you serious? You guys have met my wife, right? She busts my balls constantly. Wow. But that's so you really, like like your that. wife is the drive on the 405. Oh, how dare you? I'm just saying she's <laughs> keeping you? you grounded. She's keeping you where you like to be. Yes. You I, don't want, I have a lot of guys uh, and friends that marry women that sort of, I think my theory is that they balance them. I married a woman that is uh, sunlight. The, yeah, what's wrong it's, with her? Uh, I know, it's yeah. almost weird. Like you can tell a lot about, if you want to analyze me, you could be like, well, who did you pick? That's, yeah. that's my psychology right there. Yeah, yeah. And you see that with uh, my other friends and you're just like, oh, you wanted to balance out yes. all of the yes that you get yes. from your fans my, and your job. And not then you're only like, that. you need someone to go, you're full of shit. And I used to like that. Now I don't like that. It's uh, somebody who's too much like me makes my skin crawl. I hear I that. Like, yeah. I, I wouldn't say. Maybe these days I could deal with a little better. But. My wife is like me on my, my wife is like my best self. She's like young me. She's like she's a pure way me. Yeah, she's yeah, way, way, no, no. I, I mean, I've lost, I've lost touch with the part of me that is like her. Ah. And she reminds me of that. Part so what is that pathology you were talking about that you lean into? Well, I have a lot of dysfunctions that I lean into, but one of them that I was saying is, um, if what, this Dunning-Kruger effect, mm. I, I get in arguments with comedians all the time, art, fun argument, debates about whether or not you should blame the audience. And I'm like, Dude, whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to like keep at it. You're, you're doing something very frightening and, and hard. So if I get off stage and go like, I was great and they sucked, that's beautiful. It keeps me going. Do you do that often? Constantly. Constantly. I'll do it on stage while I'm performing. You I'll go shit on the audience. You guys in a fun way. It's everything I'm doing is to delight them. I'm never Some of that showed like, up in crashing, didn't it? What do you, which part? I, that shitting on audience. I kind of feel like that business in the temple was a little bit of that. So, <laughs> yeah, so a little bit of that. For sure. Well, we're looking at the relationship. I just did a show, you know Jeff Tweedy from Wilco? No. Okay. Well, he did my Largo. I have a monthly show at Largo and he was playing music and he did this joke that really blew me away cuz he was like he said to the audience, he's like, whenever I look out in an audience, I'm like, I'd be friends with like five of you. And it was so funny to me because it's this interesting, yeah. instead of placating, he was like sacrificing the whole audience. And, and yet his whole evening was dependent on them. That's right. So funny. So what, but I don't do that. I, I won't like say, I'm not brave enough, I guess, to do that. How'd or, you get into comedy? Well, I mean, how, how would you like me to answer that? <laughs> with the truth? I mean, literally, literally, linearly, psychologically, you know uh, what I mean? Like both. Like how like, deep words, would like, you like me to like, go on that? Or like what motivated you in the comedy? How about that? Uh, peacemaking. Peace. I wanted to make peace. With whom? With my parents. So to give you a Dr. Drew answer, <laughs> what? I, I didn't understand the answer. So go ahead. Give me a Dr. Drew answer. You got a real, if you were my therapist, was a puss. would spend a lot of time <laughs> with me dealing with your face. <laughs> that makes me feel good. To put them, it's a put them. Listen, uh, what I mean is, my parents. Uh, I, I, I joke that my parents are still together, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I love them very much, and yes. I want to be clear about that. But uh, they don't. They don't get along. It's one yeah. of those relationships that, in online dating and stuff, you would just never see it. Yeah. Like, there's just too much data on a first date now. Yeah. I think they would have figured out, like, oh Jesus Christ, I'm working out some weird shit with this relationship. Yeah. But they got married and they had kids, and then they. I sort of had to deal with. Um, three, my brother, my mom, and my father, just not speaking each other's language at all. Mm -hmm. I said that I felt like the Rosetta Stone. I spoke mom, I spoke dad, I sp and nobody really spoke my brother. And was that funny? You made it funny? Well, we're getting to that. Yeah. You're an inpatient therapist. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we gotta move along. The doctor, <laughs> what, what are we, out of time? Oh, man. 
uh, my mom didn't speak dad and my dad didn't speak mom. Got so it. what I, I would, and I would watch this in real time. This is one of the reasons I'm good at reading audiences is because I, I grew up in sort of like a tense. Where you had to, yeah, you where had I, to. It, it was important. Yeah, yeah. Your like survival as a kid depended, your emotional survival depended right. on reading these people. And my, the brain cells that are good at that survived because yeah. I needed them every, no, I have that every too. single night. I was like, I, I can tell an audience yeah. very easily because I'm like, this is nothing compared to six o'clock at the, Holmes family yeah. dinner. You know? Were they hyper religious too? No, not really. Not not really. Not in the way that we think of that. They, we were religious, but that sort of comes later. Did you ever see that that uh, Saturday Night Live skit with uh, I think it's Gwyneth Paltrow with a, and Will Ferrell, and they're just eating dinner and not talking to each other, except when they just start yelling at each other all of a sudden. <laughs> Was that your family? <laughs> I my family. Uh, it's it's sort of hard to remember. That's one thing that's weird about me is I, I don't remember a lot of my childhood. Um, but I do remember that they weren't getting along. There was no physicality. Mm. There was no broken plates, nothing really dramatic. There's a lot of absence. So sometimes my dad wouldn't be there for dinner and I would ingest that tension. Mm. So this gets to the answer of your question. Mm. I realized that if I put on a show, like a lot of people learn this, put on the show, it would make my mom laugh. It would make my brother laugh, or at least it would like, or if my dad was there, it would give everyone something to comment on other than their <laughs> relations together. Were you already doing that, say, in school too? Yeah. Yeah. I was so, doing that. So you honed it. I was deaf, but I wasn't really funny in school as much as I was sort of uh, brave and, and very hammy and loud. Well, talking to lots of comedians so far, it's, it's all of them are trying to solve something like this. But, but almost everyone, I think, stayed with that strategy because he or she was funny. And, right. and, and so that's what I've noticed. It's like, oh, it, it worked for you. And that's why you kept going and then you honed it. Well, I, okay. So now we're talking about what my talent is. My, Nick Kroll said this to me once and I really felt seen when he said this is that, uh, I, I kind of, I call it like a two tiered brain. I can think while I'm talking. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that while I was, when I was a kid was that other people didn't seem to have the same propensity to think while they were talking. Mm -hmm. You see this in freestyle rapping. You see this in improv improvisation. And is that, is that thinking that, the thinking ahead of what you're going to say, ahead. or is it listening to it that the person's responding? It can be to either. It can that. be both. Yeah. But I really, the first time I really got a glimpse of it was when I was, I, I was a reenactor. It was one of my first jobs in Salem, Massachusetts. And I was dressed as a Puritan and it was all improvised. We had to um, arrest a woman on the charge of witchcraft and would yell out to the crowd and be like, hear ye, hear ye, this day, Bridget Bishop has been accused of witchcraft. And I realized that I was- Massachusetts? Yeah, that I was saying witchcraft, but really I was like three sentences down the line. And then I watched other people, no disrespect to other people. I just noticed that the needle seemed to be more on the record for yeah, them. Yeah. They were saying, they were like, hello, I am here. Yeah, and yeah. they were in the E and here, yeah. hello, I am here. And there are times when I can be talking and I don't even know what I'm going to say. It's almost like the separate language center that's just like, don't worry, Pete. I do it on my podcast all the time. But it's I'm processing. sort of doing it right now. Yeah, well, you, you must, right? But I, I do I'm not that. thinking about what I'm saying. It's communication is happening. It's I, like I get a, it. It's an effortless I, thing. I'll tell you what, what I do is I'm, I listen more than I'm thinking what I'm going to say ahead. Oh, interesting. And then when I listen whatever comes out of me from that is what I rely on. Yeah. So for me to get up and give a proclamation about the witchcraft, yeah. that'd be kind of hard. Not as easy. But if somebody was responding to my proclamation, it'd be no problem. I hear that. Kind of interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. I learned how to listen later mm. uh, by, from doing my podcast. Interesting. Yeah, that's when I, you can listen to me learn how to listen on my podcast. I was never a bad listener. But, Let me tell you something. It's funny. Listening has been that. on my mind lately. I forget why somebody was talking about it. I thought... Oh, Jordan Peterson was talking about it in a podcast. And I thought, oh man, he's a psychologist. He should know this. And probably he does. But, but there's, there's listening with your ear and then the sort of listening with your whole body. Well, that's what I tried to convince you that you're a very present person. And, and because of my bent, I was saying you're a very like, not, not let's not say spiritual person, but that awareness yeah. is, is, a. Uh, in my tradition, my current tradition, yes. I would say there's a quality of being love. Yes. So there's loving where you go like, oh, oh, Drew, I love how productive you are no. and how vocal you were about how you don't like traffic. That's like intellectual love. Uh -huh. And then there's just the state of being love, which is more of a spaciousness. That, and I know you know this, that you provide for people and for yourself. Well, and I would argue to, to pile on the spiritual piece that provides the spiritual plane. That's so right. That, that's something that exists between Spaciousness us. Spaciousness is key. Yeah. Freedom is key. These yeah. are the spiritual things. Spiritual is such a loaded word. Those are the 
virtues or those are the the techniques that I really enjoy. And that's what I think you're doing when you work with addicts. And that's what I think you do when Mm -hmm. you do therapy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think you do when you're, when you say listening, there is listening like uh, talk show host listening where you're going like, well, let's see, he said, this is, I, I have this mode where I'm like, he keeps saying this word. I could make a joke about how he keeps saying that word. That's a comedian thing. That's a comedian yeah. thing. My, my but, thing is I'm yeah. listening to how my body reacts to them, how I'm yeah. feeling in the moment, what it's thoughts perfect. and music and smells occur to me and what, what could that mean? It's because it's not mine. It's being perfect. co-created. Right? What I've noticed doing my podcast is that people, it's a little bit paradoxical, enjoy a mix of spaciousness and feedback so what I'm doing is I'm being spacious, and then if they admit a vulnerability, I'll match them with something as vulnerable or more vulnerable mm. to make, and I, I do something that therapists do all the time, which I, I say, I match, and I yeah. also say it's a safe space, which is weird, but language matters. Mm-hmm. Language matters, mm-hmm. so when you say it's a safe space, or when you say, and it's true, we can edit anything out that you don't want, we're making this together, I'm not here to trick you or get you, um, people really do want to share. Of course, we're 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 alone. We feel lonely in here. It can, that's that's a thing that psychedelics can really help you experience viscerally. Is that you're like in this thing, this, this vessel, meat puppet, this vessel, yeah, going around, like, bring me the water, <laughs> and you, and you feel it behind your eyes, right? Yeah, and it's very, um, it can feel very isolated and very lonely, and that and that's where a lot of people. Uh, are hurting, I think. So, so like art, for example, is like I draw a house and I go like, when I see a house, I, I see this. Is that what you see? It's like about building a bridge between us. And when I do comedy and I say, I'm afraid of this, are you afraid of that? It builds a bridge. So now, when I got into comedy to, to like make a distraction and like entertain for your family, the, the peacemaking. Yeah. Now I do it for solidarity because that is that's the most beautiful thing. Solidarity with, between you with and the, the audience, audience or amongst yeah. the audience. Amongst and between me and you. And yeah. is there a recipe for that? Honesty. Honesty, humility, and openness. I think those are essential. When did the religious stuff get involved? Well, I was, I was raised... So your question was whether or not my parents were religious. Yeah. Sometimes I think when I, if I say yes to that, we're going to picture the wrong thing that we were well, like... Well, let me put it this way. I, I feel like you speak a religious language a lot. Yeah. And I saw your writing in Crashing where that was a major yeah. theme. Yeah. So I'm guessing this is something important to you. No, it's super important. Yeah. I think it's important to know, though, that it wasn't like a Bible household. Mm-hmm. My dad was pretty, uh, I hate the word secular, but non-religious, mm-hmm. let's say. He was really, he like oh, he's he, alcoholic. He was an alcoholic. Oh, yeah. amazing. <laughs> Shocking. I mean, it's, it's so funny that the kid in me is still afraid to say yeah. that. I, I think my dad would say that he struggled with alcohol. Oh, okay, yes. so there you go. Um, so yeah, he had that. And, and we all had those tendencies. We had narcissistic tendencies mm. um, and, and some of that. Yeah, sort of and stuff. May, the, but the well, having the alcoholic dad creates the narcissistic issues. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of that yeah. going on. And, and I have some of that going yeah, on. That's yeah. some of the stuff that I work with is narcissism sure. and self-involvement. It's funny. And, and I wouldn't, I don't consider narcissism a pejorative. Uh, as you were saying narcissistic disorder, personality disorder. Well, then it's rare. pejorative. Then it's, yeah, it's, it's rare. Very rare. It's rare. But if somebody. We have narcissistic tendencies. Yeah. Traits and tendencies and stuff. It's like, that's everybody today. That's right. You know. And, and we and, also live in a culture that values that. Oh yeah. We're, I'm, a, I'm a three. Do you know the Enneagram? I'm an achiever mm-hmm. and we live in a three country mm-hmm. that values achieving. So being an achiever in an achiever world it, it, and, and being a narcissist or having narcissistic tendencies and yeah. being a comedian is yeah. also rewarded. So it makes it doubly Well, you, you have to have narcissistic issues to want to get up in front of an audience. You, there's got to be something that gratifies that. Completely agree. Yeah. I've noticed over 20 years of doing stand-up that you can alchemize that lead a little absolutely. bit. And you can oh, start absolutely. to have... 100%. It's not, I, it's not all negative. I've seen other comedians but you, listen, do it's, it's actually kind of, to me, it's almost a neutral. It's just a personality trait. Right. You know what I mean? You could have dependent traits. You could have OCD traits. Just working you could, with what you were given. And you could use them to your advantage or right. to a liability. Liability becomes when... You lose empathy, you lose concern for feelings, especially other people's. Right. Now, we, now we have a problem. Right. Now we have a problem. That's why going up hoping that people feel less alone is a really nice thing. So the it's, religious thing, you just keep avoiding that, it seems like. No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I was avoiding a short answer. I, uh, I really want to talk about okay. this. Um, but it's a more complicated answer than saying we were religious. Because mm-hmm. as I was saying, my father wasn't super religious. He was just like, his attitude about the church was, and this is a quote, you're better with it than without it. Mm-hmm. You're better with it than without it, Peter. He's right. He just wanted us to be normal. He's though. right. 
he wanted us to be normal. I know that you've been with dying people and you see the benefits of a, a belief yes. in a higher power. I don't know if my dad was like that. Uh, he was more well, he like to people and when they seem to be happier and behave better when they're yeah, you're right. You're right. Let's <laughs> give my dad some credit. Yeah. You're right. He was like, it's normal up here. You don't want to be a fucking weird family. Well, especially did he grew up in Massachusetts. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, every little think about every little town. What do you see in every tiny little town? It's the first thing you see a church, the white steeples. Yeah. Right. I thought you were going to say that one weird family that didn't go to church. I think this is what my father would fear is the family that didn't go to church. Well, in those uh, Massachusetts are different. What, what town? Lexington. Okay. So just outside of Boston. Yeah. Two, two towns over, basically. Right out the two. But you'd see, like, right? I would On the way see, to Athol. Right off Mass Ave. Is oh. You mean? You're right up there. Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, but we would see the families that would have the, like, 12-year-old kids that were, like, lighting the, the, tr- the school on fire. Yeah. And then they'd be like, that's it. We're going to church. Yeah. And, we, and my parents would probably have been like, it's too late. You got you to gotta well, start early. True. So they knew that. True, yeah. But they started going to an evangelical church called the Vineyard when my mother and father mm. were dating, I'm pretty sure. So they went from being Catholic to being evangelical. And then when we started going to church as a family, we went to Grace Chapel in Lexington, which is a non-denominational, but evangelical. Unitarian, sort of? It's not Unitarian. Uh, Although I think you mean universalist. No, there's a lot of Unitarian stuff in Massachusetts, but yeah. Yeah, it was more, it was heaven hell. Yeah. Uh, uh, Most people, when they say Unitarian, mean Unitarian Universalist. I think there are Unitarians that aren't Universalists. Oh, who knows? And there are Catholics. Far be it for me. Catholic means universal. Anyway, the idea is when I started going to church and I took to it hard, and this is the story that I tell in my book, uh, which is called Comedy, Sex, God, if people are interested in this sort of thing. It's Comedy, like, Sex, God. I'm going to take you through all those today. It's available. <laughs> yes, please. It's available uh, for pre-order. It would mean a lot if you wanted to check it out. Oh. So anyway, the story goes, and it's in the book, um, the, the house life wasn't great, wasn't very stable. And school life wasn't very stable. I was teased a lot in school. For what? A lot of kids. Too were. tall? No, no, no. Being soft and clammy handed and having Did you breasts. play sports? No. Okay. <laughs> what, what kind of, well, you weren't like, what kind of high school was it? Well, I went, I went to a public high school yeah. and that was actually really good for me. Mm. Although it was very, very stressful. I had, a, I had a bald spot on the side of my head from stress. Wow. And what's weird is... Alopecia areata. No one in my family thought it was weird. Is that what it's called? Alopecia areata? Mm-hmm. People always ask, did you pick it? I'm like, I would have told no, you oh, I no, picked no. my hair stress. out. It's from stress. Jink- I like went, people have a car accident, all of a sudden they'll lose a piece of hair. Because I went from a Quaker school where, where my teachers called me by my... We called the teachers by their first name and... I used to joke, we didn't get grades. You either got a hug or a slightly firmer hug. It was very hippie. Yeah. And then I wanted to go to a regular, regular, a public high school. Mm. And I went from like three classes a day learning about like basket weaving to like five classes a day and bells and a, a campus that was bigger than my college. And you'd have to walk from here to here and you only had five minutes lugging all your books. It was, it was a real hobby. Yeah, where'd you go to college? Sure. Well, then I went to Gordon College, which Gordon. is a Christian college. Right. But it seems like religion was you you were like having like a landscape of religions it's like you had a whole seascape not really where did you get that quaker evangelical catholic i wish my quaker school that's a lot i wish the quaker school had been more spiritual because i'm very i think the quakers are really groovy Uh, for better or worse they're not very proselytizing did you see um rob delaney's version of it in uh catastrophe no you, you should watch. Oh, it's really? Funny. The Quakers, he talks about Quakers? He goes to a Quaker church for, for a while. Oh, really? And then loses it on the Quakers. Really? You'll see. You'll see. That's interesting. I yeah. wonder what you could lose it on the Quakers. They're so they're, meek. That's what he loses it about. Oh, they're so that, meek. That there's reasons to be angry about certain things. That's and, funny. When yeah. I, I've been to a Quaker meeting in Pasadena, actually, and they, they seemed pretty worked up, actually, about social issues, and they were Good. very on like what happened in the news this week and what we should be protesting yeah, and what, who we should be helping. So they seem That's how I always imagined them. Very socially right. active. Oh no, they are. My yeah. school was very progressive. Yeah. Like before we knew what transgender was way before you yeah. guys, you know what I mean? I, it was Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts I and know. a Quaker school. I get it. But like they weren't very spiritual. We did meditate. Like we had silent meeting every day, but they didn't teach us how to meditate and they didn't really teach us. <laughs> the school was very devoid of, of spirit. And I think they did that on purpose. They didn't want to mix, yeah. you know, church and state kind of. Let, let me... I sort of wish they had. I get that. <laughs> L- let me cut to something, though, that I, I think a lot about. Can religion help us today? Because I, I, I sometimes feel like we need some sort of great awakening mm. like we had in the 19th century. Like we, And I'm not even sure that it has to be religious. Could be just spiritual so-called. Yeah. But I feel like we need like some sort of 
movement <laughs> together. Right. Uh, I, I don't know what it needs to be or what it looks like. Do you well, have religion, that? okay, so religion means religio. Ligio comes from the word ligament, like to connect. So mm -hmm. it's to reconnect. It's okay. to remember, we'll it's to remember our, our oneness. Jesus is doing this all the time. When he says, what you do, the least of these you do to me, this is called unitive consciousness, right? Yep. It's the idea that you, Dr. Drew, I actually, I'm, I'm kind of sketching out a joke right now where I'm like, I understand, um, I want to be very sensitive, one, but one of the reasons I, I relate to the transgender I, idea, the predicament or whatever you want to call it, the, the obstacle, mm -hmm. is that I relate to it very hard. They say, I don't feel like my gender. I'm like, right on. I don't feel like my body either. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a really good start. Yeah. I feel like I am awareness and I'm stuck in one of these. And we're yeah. back to that idea. And then we're back to the, and if you want to be called a different pronoun, I'm like, yeah, words are very, very powerful. I'd like to, to call, I don't want you to call me you. I want you to call me me. Like, I want to go like, this me is Dr. Drew. This me is, uh, is <laughs> a Jewish guy recording it. What I'm saying is, this me, <laughs> th this me just lost a child. Or, How are me or, feeling or, about this? Or this me is uh, starving to death. <coughs> what I'm saying is, that's... We're all part of ourselves. That's no, unitive. We're all part of this. It's unitive consciousness. Yeah, I get that. And, and I'm not, that's a joke, obviously. But there is something... Did me get this, Nadav? <laughs> <laughs> me got it me. there's some... no 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 me got it this, me got that it. me got it yeah, that me got, got it. it but you know that is an awakening of sorts one of the reasons why we don't care about the planet is because you know we've forgotten our that place we're, in the world that we're a member of yeah. it that you're as much like a, tr a part of the earth as a tree is <laughs> right. my friend michael gunger has a book called this and he calls human beings the wireless upgrade but you are as dependent on the earth as a tree oh, is. of course and, and you're breathing in the air. Oh, and you're, but we, we're, we've succumbed to this illusion that we're this thing, like we're this alien visitor. And we're here to like fuck it and, and eat it and drink it. And like we've become a parasite instead of harmonious with one another and with the earth. And here we are in Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. And I understand that that sounds kind of trite. That is the type of thing that I think can help. This show, not, this show is going to bum your high so badly. What's that I blame with? me in there. What do you mean? You'll see. Oh, you mean because we're going to watch clips and mm -hmm, stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, some me's, it's, it's challenging to love all of me. <laughs> but don't you see how helpful that language is? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. I, I just don't like the government mandating language. That's all. Oh, we talked about that. Yeah. I just, I, no, I understand it's that this me doesn't want the government telling him what language to use. He, this just, me doesn't it just, want... It goes to a very bad place. I if understand you that. Put, uh, yeah, I understand that. But what we see, because we're not having a lot of balance, is we're seeing extreme cases mm -hmm. of people speaking out for, for these types of ideas. Um, and we need to find balance. Yes, I agree yeah. with balance. But I don't, I don't know if religion is the answer. The reason I wrote my book, though, it's two R's. I wrote it to relieve suffering, because I saw a lot of people raised like me who lost their faith like I did. My wife left me and I lost my faith. Oh, I, this is your second wife? No, no, no. Yeah, this is my second wife. Val is my I second wife. I did not know mm -hmm. that. So I went through a divorce. So the cr story of crashing is true. Oh, were you, were you doing all the same stuff at the time? What do you mean? A, as in Material? the story? Of, <laughs> no, no, trying to get comedy going. You know, Basically. Is, 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 that your, is that autobiographical? We turned, the, we turned the clock back a little bit to make the story better. Yeah. I was a little bit more ad advanced as a stand-up when yeah. my wife left. Yeah. I was just about to do colleges. So I was basically in season two when I was in season and, one. And the guy <laughs> that she cheated with, was he as much of a shithead as he was in the... In no, the... we changed the guy very much. Mm. I actually liked the man that she left me for. And Damn. still, I still think he's a fine person. Uh, um, that me fucked my wife. <laughs> that me fucked the me that's my wife. Listen, what I'm saying is he was a, he was a great guy and I understood... He was, he was a lot of things that I wasn't. He was very macho. He was very muscly. He was a man's man. And especially back then, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing fucking Lululemon now, but like, especially back then, I didn't have my identity as an adult. Not just, let's not use the word man. I'm mm. just like as a grown person. <laughs> I didn't have agency. I didn't know myself. I was a baby boy. And I look back now, and this is another big part of Comedy Sex God, as my wife leaving me as as a graceful thing, as a, as a necessary suffering. Oh, I'm sure, because you're so great with your wife now. Why so would kids. you change? This is Richard Rohr, the Franciscan friar. Why would you change without suffering? You won't. If you don't suffer, you won't change. That's how it works. And if you've taken psychedelics, you can see just as when there's forward, there's backwards, there's this great balance and harmony and lawfulness to the universe. And we play this game where we want to maximize pleasure and minimize pain and avoid suffering. But that's our biology. 
Of that course just, it is. It's just our biological I, I totally imperative. understand yeah. that it's built into it yeah, and we yeah. had to run from lions and there's a need yes. for it. And believe me, when I'm about to get in a car accident, I'm grateful for those instincts. Yes. But we need to realize from a spiritual level or consciousness level, you know, I use that term very loosely, that suffering is the impetus that it's the sandpaper that, that pushes us into the cave that we need to go to, but and, we're afraid to. And go which to. psychedelic was it that caused you to see that? Well, I took mushrooms after my wife left me, maybe like two years after my wife left me. And that w that's what sort of cracked open the door back to Did that help you with your grief? That's a good question. I think it took a long time for me to really unpack and be honest with my grief and mm. my anger. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of my early churching was that uh, I made the mistake that I, unfortunately, no judgment, that I think a lot of evangelicals make, that they think the point is to be nice. <laughs> Oh, and as Richard Rohr says, nice is not in the New Testament once. The word nice is not in the New Testament, right? Which I think is a brilliant point. I was like, it's not nice to be angry. We also want to jump to forgiveness nice to and exactly jump to all these things that take hard work. Who knows more than you? You need to eat it. You need to eat it and digest it and wrestle with it and and listen to yourself and listen to your subconscious and and don't just go, well, Jesus told me to forgive, so I forget. Fuck bullshit, right? I, another great Richard Rohr point, people often jump to like, I love Jesus, but they don't love anything else. Right. He's, and, like, you, you, I, he's like, I'll believe that you love Jesus if you can love your neighbors. We see this all the time nature in, in, in reality. treating drug addicts when they, they flight, to, flight to health. They're yeah. fly, uh, I'm, I'm fine now, I'm cured. I'm you see that in spirituality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's called the end jump. They jump right to it and they're like, I'm there. When, when the process is beautiful, mourning is beautiful. If I could go back to the Pete that got left by his wife and I really was blindsided, I'd just be like, don't rush, sit with it. Did she, did she do a uh, ghosting on you? Did she just disappear one day? No. Because apparently men do that. A lot of ghosting. Yeah, they'll just like, after 20 years of marriage, just the wife comes home and is like, where, where, where's this guy? Oh, interesting. Weird. I think it's because if I were to guess that they don't have the, the courage to face. Right. And they, and then the they, and then they are ashamed. If they're narcissistic, they will, there would be sh experiencing shame if they yeah. were to come to terms with it. Right. And they're repellent of shame. Well, you so can't just, write gone. your own story in your own favor. If you have all this contradictory evidence, yeah. I'm sure she'll be fine or yeah. she probably knows it's for the best or whatever. Right. But if you're there for the aftermath, you can't, you don't have the luxury of that delusion. So she didn't leave. She 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 was nice about it in in a way that she you know she did a couple things that were nice. She ha she was having an affair for about four months. Ew. And then she made up her mind though. I appreciated this. She t when she told me she was having an affair, we were so codependent and so yeah. wishy washy. And like I said, I didn't have agency. I didn't have any power or decisiveness. Isn't it weird that you feel like your life as you knew it? Phew, it's like like. Uh, like the record scratch. But what I appreciated was she said, I'm leaving. She wasn't like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Hello, I Unfortunately, I though, I, I, I'm not as uh, forgiving or as understanding as you because when there's somebody else that you've decided to leave too, everybody always leaves. They just go. When, when somebody, somebody can be complaining, 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 and when they just go one day, it's because they're going to that next person they're in. You mean the bridge relationship? In other words, if she not had somebody she was planning to stay with, she would have hung. Well, she told me that. Yeah. She she said she wasn't strong enough to leave without me. She, but she also told me that she knew she wanted to leave pretty much right when we got married. Yeah. I think she, again, my amateur diagnosis that a lot of us have father wounds and a lot yeah. of mother wounds. And I think right. she was um, rebelling in a way by leaving me. She was sort of, I don't want to get too much into her psychology, although no one knows Who's my, who my ex-wife is. Were you living in Massachusetts at the time? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, well, no, we were living in New York. Okay. I think she was, I think she was acting out some psychology that didn't well, have course. to do with just me. Well, of course. But it, I didn't realize that at the time. But I mean, the marrying you was part of that too, though. Totally. Right? Yeah. So. All of it was. But yeah. she, you know, I, I, I was just thinking about that, that she told me that she kissed another guy while we were engaged and I just didn't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Like I was just like, because here's my confession Den denial yes and i was in a lot of denial is i really wanted to move to chicago to do comedy and i didn't want to go alone and i couldn't move in with somebody mm -hmm. that i wasn't married to so my her. what's that exploiting her exactly it's deceit that's the that's the dark side of the achiever is deceit so that's my people don't like the word sin i'm one of them but in the enneagram test i think the word sin, sin is, is fine whether we deceit it, with the sin is no different than it's just another word it's murk yeah my murkiness my blind spot yeah sin defense my unconscious acting out whatever you want to call it i like calling it unconsciousness my unconscious unconsciousness. motivation it's all who cares i i don't 
whatever word speaks to an individual, that's the one I would like to use. I've said it a million is that if you were watching the story and this took a long time, but this is my healing. This is what my healing looks like. If you were watching the story of my wife and I, you would have been rooting for my wife to leave. And it wasn't because I was uncaring or unkind. I was very sweet. I was very nice. I was very present. I was around. I don't know about present in a deep way, yeah. not in a Dr. Drew way, but I was there. People always think because I, I must've been touring or something. It wasn't that. I was just a baby boy. I got married when I was 22 and I, I, I understand and forgive her now. All right, I wanna tell you about our friends at Care Of. It's a subscription service that makes it easy to get vitamins, protein powders, and more personalized just for you, delivered to your door. I was a little skeptical at first, but then you go online and you, and you personalize it exactly for you. And uh, the combination of vitamins they sent me, I was actually rather impressed by, and I've been taking them to this day. And uh, there's an online quiz about your diet, health goals, health goals, lifestyle choices. It only takes about five minutes, but that online survey is what they use to give you a very specific personalized care of subscription box. It comes right to your door every month, personalized daily packs. It's all in one packet, so you just take it all down all at once. It's perfect for people that are busy. And uh, there are nutrition packed quick stick powders also that can be added to your monthly delivery for an extra easy boost whenever you need it. Carob's protein powders have clean labels and they're made with organic ingredients like coca and Himalayan pink sea salt, whey from free range and grass fed cows from Ireland. Vegan and vegetarian supplement options are available. They, they really have tried to think of everything. So uh, I'm, I'm rather pleased with care of, and uh, I, it's hard to please me on this topic. So I think go online, take the quiz. It wouldn't cost, doesn't cost you anything to, to see what they have to offer. And they even have stuff for brain function, which I like a lot. Now, I want to remind you that you can get 30% off your first care of order, which again, I don't know how we do this, but go to care of, take care of rather, takecareof.com. Enter the code Dr. Drew 30. Again, it is takecareof.com, D R D R E W 30. And you'll have your own care of box delivered to your door monthly. It, uh, and again, you can add the protein powders, you can add the nutrient pack quick stick powders. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, and uh, I'm impressed with them. So check it out at takecareof.com. Enter code D R D R E W 30, Dr. Drew 30. Thank you. I want to thank Care of for partnering with me on this video, and thank you to Care of for being a sponsor of the show. And now another sponsor of ours, Calm.com. Now, I think most people are aware that stress is a worldwide epidemic. It's interesting. They asked parents what uh, young people, are, what their children are dealing with the most, and they put peer pressure, all kinds of things. Well, the kids answered stress. Kids even. Well, that's why we're partnering with Calm. It's the number one app to help you reduce your anxiety and stress, help you sleep better. I use the Calm app, the sleep the sleep options, the things they have for sleep are awesome. They really did help me sleep. More than 40 million people around the world have downloaded Calm. If you head to calm.com, C-A-L-M, calm.com slash Dr. Drew, you will get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes guided meditations, issues like anxiety, stress, focus, uh, a brand new meditation every day. And they're high quality. It's not what you think. You really need to check it out. There are also sleep stories, which are bedtime, bedtime stories designed for adults to help you relax. Uh, head to the magical lavender fields of Southern France with Stephen Fry or explore moonlit jungles with Leona Lewis. After that, they have soothing music and more. They have all kinds of options. They have ASMR, all kinds of stuff. And it's all really well done. So right now, Dr. Drew After Dark listeners gets 25% off the Calm premium subscription at calm, C-A-L-M dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. That is calm dot com slash Dr. Drew. Get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today. It's an app. It's on my phone right now. It's right. You can see it if you want to see it. Uh, calm.com slash Dr. Drew, C-A-L-M dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Get Calm. Stop stressing. Now, back to the show. I'm going to ease you into our program here. From uh, This is a really cool guy has a question. Okay. Uh, is it hey, Nadav? Uh, no, really cool guys populate our world here at uh, your mom's house. Uh, you cool guys and mommies are sort of the specialty of the house. Uh, would I, right, Nadav? I, is that about accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have the coolest guys here at, from uh, YMH Studios. Yeah. The cool guys are the ones that send us things. Okay. Is uh, this like lingo? Yeah. Uh, here you go. Your opinion on using high amounts of marijuana to reduce the withdrawal symptoms for other harder drugs such as painkillers and prescription amphetamines or even cocaine from a really cool guy. Um, You're asking me? Well, we're going to answer <laughs> together. It's okay, good. titled Weaning with Weed. Uh, people do it all the time. Uh, it does work a lot of the time. Uh, you have to smoke a lot of it or eat a lot of edibles. It's not what you call a good idea. Uh, you can hurt yourself. You know, if you're 
what people will typically use is, is do is alcohol and weed, and then you can get into real biological problems in your, in your brain through the withdrawal or the withdrawal from the alcohol. I mean, if you need something to help you withdraw from a substance, get, get somebody to manage it with you. And even if you decide to do it with a doctor with cannabis, make sure it's it's supervised, just just so somebody's watching you. You can get into all kinds of trouble with mood, suicidality, seizures. It, it can be a mess. So. It, it's the thing about drug withdrawal. People think, oh, no, I'll smoke a lot of pot or I'll just drink to get through it. I, I, you, it's hard to predict for a given individual the, the manifestations of a withdrawal syndrome. It can be protean and it can be dangerous and it can be simple and not bad. But I, So I can't predict, but having somebody watching is there is a good idea. All right, virginity burden. Oh, I'll know this one. Okay. Uh, I'm 20, soon to be 21. I'm a virgin. When did you lose your virginity, Pete? 21. Here we go. I'm not a virgin for religious reasons as I give... Well, I'm out. <laughs> oh, yours were for religious reasons? No. I mean, yeah, of course. Oh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, nobody was offering, but that it was... wasn't the man boobs you discussed it, it earlier? Was, it would, no, the, people wanted to get in those. Um, <laughs> it was a convenient uh, excuse. Ah. I was abstinent for the Lord, but nobody was offering. I'm not a virgin for religious reasons as I gave up on that shit a while ago. The short version is that I went to an all-girls high school, so this is a girl where I became depressed and a bit chubby. When I went to college, I felt like it would be strange to lose my virginity to a one-night stand. Yes. I feel like my virginity has become a burden. I've heard of women talk about this, where they just sort of want to get rid of it. I want to have sex, but I don't want to go through explaining my virginity to some guy and be subjected to his judgment. Spelled properly. Well done. Uh, are men weirded out by older virgins? We don't know. Oh, she's almost 21. This is not older. Uh, that's uh, my age. <laughs> yeah, it's probably all in my head, but I hope you give me some clarity. So, Pete, this one's perfect for you. Of course it's all in your head. Yes. That is fine. You're fine. Nobody, Nobody's going to think that's weird. I, it's, I, I I've feel... never met a woman that said, I wish I lost my virginity sooner. No. Yeah. It's great. It's great. You'll be fine. But nothing more... is wrong. Yeah. There's nothing is wrong is the <laughs> bottom line here. But more importantly, don't do it in a one night stand unless it's something you really, really want to do. Otherwise, get a relationship going and have somebody actually cares about you. You'll, you'll find that person. And what's the rush? What is the rush? Just enjoy it. No, nothing's going anywhere. You'll be fine. Okay. So uh, here we go, Pete. We're warming up. <laughs> this next one is entitled Fistula Woes. Fistula Woes? Fistula Woes. Do you know what a fistula is? Oh, I thought it was fish jello. No, fistula is like infections that come out of the wall, your colon, and, and uh, or your, even your small bowel, and burrow through up to your skin. Oh, okay. So it's like your colon coming through to your skin. Wow. Happens a lot. I have a 23-year-old male of a fistula with a drain occurring from an abscess not related to anal penetration. Thank you for that clarification. Cool guy. Uh, when going full throttle with the ladies, I'm always incredibly self-conscious about my butt drainage, reasonably so. I've always been an honest and open guy, but struggle explaining they have to wear women's pads because my butt constantly leaks pus. Yeah. True. Dude, uh, this is giving me flashbacks. I used to listen to Loveline. Yes. And there was a guy who couldn't stop farting when he was having sex. Yeah. And your answer was, if you're not mature enough to get over that, you're probably not mature enough to be having sex. Decent answer. Yeah. Maybe I had a little Metamucil. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd, uh, you see, see the brown and farting and sharding and all that is extremely valued by these guys. That yeah. Do the, so they're it's wanting really gross. I wanted, your mom's house. Yeah. Oh, it is, it is high currency. No, she farted so Confirmed. much. Confirmed. We love it. Yeah. So much while I was on that podcast. So here we go. I tried, oh, oh is that true? Yeah. She farted the whole time you were on the podcast. Like I was making like my, my deep points. <laughs> and Christina P started and farting. She'd be farting right in the middle of them. Yeah, big hot ones. I am so sorry. How, what is wrong with her? I don't know. But let me ask you this. Because yeah, I was thinking about please. it. Please. You know why George Burns smokes a cigar? Just a, just a good smoke. Because he loves smoke. No. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, maybe, but probably. But like the cigar is the Penis. Of, official. Well, Fouls. yeah, sure. It's so a power th symbol. But it's also, it fills the room. And that's oh. what comedy is. It fills, it fucks the room. Oh. So it fills the room with a, Ew, with a smell. Ew, that's a great insight. And the dick is the penis, is, is the, cigar the cigar of the body, right? And comedy is very dickish. It's very, you're, you're taking over Is that why room. fat guys sometimes make comedy? It's yeah, part maybe. Of the take it over They're the taking thing. over more yeah. space. Yeah. So I was thinking about this on the ride in. Would it be as funny if Tom farted? And I was like, no, it's funnier because we have a harder time giving authority to things that receive things, which are women. <laughs> Authority to things that receive things. Yeah. That's things that are receptive. I'm not, this is not a new point. This is why we this say fuck you. This point. is why we say cocksucker yeah, is an yeah. insult. 
gay men and women yeah. that receive things tend to get less respect from idiots. I'm not saying woke yes, people. Yes, tend to be given, given status it's in our, from idiots. Exactly. It's, we want to be the thing. We respect things that fuck. We yeah. like pipelines. We yeah, like well, it's missiles. More aggressive. We it's like aggression. guns. We like yeah. cigars. Yeah. We like big cars. Okay. We like fucking. And so, and so Christina's, Christina's response, response is, is fuck farting. you. Is she's expelling something. Uh. And she's saying... So on a psych deep psychological level, I think she's like, it's funnier that it's a woman because she's like, look, here's the thing that you think receives things pushing out into your atmosphere. Fuck you. Now I have such respect for her. It's and not only is she it, filling the room with the fart, but she's sharding on top a of A little that. bit, I bet. And so there's something really actually being produced. Post-pregnancy, you, you know she's sharding a little bit. You Oh, she is. she's made that a habit now. You must Great. play this for Christina, okay? Uh, your well, mom's if house? Tom did yeah, it, sure. would we laugh? I don't think it would be as funny because Tom's got his big beard already fucking the room. Well, yeah. he's a lot more selective with his farts. I mean, Nobody Christina wants the Tom farts. I think he's a little grossed out by it. He is himself. So let's, <laughs> let's go back to official woes. I try to hide it as long as possible, which always affects the relationship from developing to the next stage. What should I do? I'm currently on the public waiting list for a lift procedure, but I have to wait for the infection to go away. Um... I think you gotta. Women are extru Women have to put up with men. This is, is a man, right? We decided. Yeah. Yeah. Women have to put up with men, and they put up with a lot with men. And if someone's decided they're going to go to bed with you, I think you could say, "Look, I have a medical problem. It's a little bit weird. I got to explain it to you." Right. And just right up front, and and just and it's not, it's not in the field of battle. It's. I'm assuming she's not spending a lot of time back there. Right. It's a little bit. It's a little just bit. Just tell her of, the salad bar is closed. Yeah. Just salad bar is closed. It's a little bit outside of the field of ba Here, I'll do, battle. Here, I'll do Corolla for you. I know I can do a Corolla. With okay, go ahead. Dude, she already has to put up with your balls. Yeah. yeah. Women already got, it's no picnic down there. Yeah. You yeah. got to see a dick and balls. Uh, leaky assholes. No big deal. It's no big deal. To be What's fair, the big deal? It's not yeah. even your asshole. It's a fistula. It's, it, sound, it sounds refined. It's not your it's asshole. A, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fistula. It's a fistula. Can it's I a, see the wine list? What a, year is the right, fistula? Right, right. Ah. Thank you. What year is... I, I want my next... Now, this has to be a T-shirt. I want a wine bottle with fistula label. <laughs> That's a T-shirt. <laughs> That's good. Come on now, guys. When I do Help Corolla, I always want to say, can I be you and you'll be me? Like what, I, what you're I, doing I, it? Yeah. I, I'm just like, we'll read a news story and I'll be like, let me be you and you, but you try to be me. How do you do? Well, I haven't done it yet. Next oh, time I do it, I'm going to do it. There's no way. Because he's always like, if you were born a woman. You, you have to p <laughs> pitch it as an improv to him because then it's a then then he'll gauntlet do it. is down, but, but he's, he won't, I don't think he can do it. Because uh, he's not I, paying a, you know <laughs> I'd like to see if he could do it. I bet I'll he could. I bet it'd be tell funny trying not. to be you me. Because it'd be like, I don't know, people's feelings. You could do him. But him doing you. And by the way, peace and love, Adam. Peace and love. You know I love you. Um, <laughs> he is extremely perceptive, but he doesn't care enough to listen and observe his guest carefully. Interesting. So he won't really pick up on who you are very carefully. <laughs> So for him to improv, but that's it. why I thought it would be okay. Just be like a, a like a bleeding heart liberal guy. That's like, uh, come yeah, on, you're not just that. No, uh, no, no. You're a little more complicated. Than that. I appreciate that. Benefits of a damaged a hole. Wow. Or, uh, where a lot I, of buttholes. Yeah. Where did I hear something? I was. Oh, it was. Uh, was it on SNL? They said it's you are a hole in the ass, and that's the worst part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, around age seven, I was playing with my. Playing with metal scraps in the driveway, fell ass first onto sharp a piece metal, a piece of metal, lacerated my sphincter. Whoa! Until recently, with a purchase of my first bidet, I've been using paper and just tearing my shit up down there every so often, which would result in the wound reopening. Which means it's sort of a fissure. The occasional opening of the wound was painful and lasted for nearly 20 years. And sometimes when I'm away from home and I shit a lot, it still happens. My immune system is a beast. I've never gotten the flu. Strep once as a kid. I get a cold. I uh, lived in a household where everyone was sick. I read an article, article recently about the immunological evolution and benefit to nail biting. The idea of this is a steady low dose of pathogens under my fingernails introduced my body. It's probably more genetic than anything. Here's the question. Is it possible... Wait, nail that, biting is good for you? Uh, uh, I, the idea that you're putting pathogens into your mouth, like... Mm, uh, like dirt pathogens? Yeah. Like, like it's what, good to get germs in you? Yeah, there is some, the, that's the... Like sort don't of, Purell your baby? Sewer rat theory. There, there's something to that. Um, no, that's what it's called, the sewer rat theory. And, and that's why you should give kids peanuts and things like that so they don't right. get allergy to it later. Here's my question. I'm going to read it as written. And I'll be Adam. 
Is it possible that shit flowing past my wounded sphincter for 20 years has contributed to my immune strength? And if so, would you recommend doctors prescribe asshole wounds as a form of preventative treatment? This is a cool guy. Right? This is another side. That is have only not cool where I here. thought he was going to go. Um, I, I was going to be like, dude, you got to be getting some fucking psyllium. You take some psyllium husk. Thank you. You fucking weirdo. Thank you. If you have a wound on your fucking sphincter and you're not taking a binding, expanding fiber, fiber, a, a fiber, a non-absorbable non fiber, fiber, you're a fucking idiot and you deserve an ass wound and the pus that comes with it. Get that? Because I'm joking. But if you take that, you're looking at wipe free shits. I mean, not for this guy because of his pathology, but you're certainly going to do better. You're going to do better. Yeah, you're not going to open it. If his... I miss my psyllium husk, I feel like this guy the day he fell I, on a I found his psyllium husk too, and it's changed it's, my life. It's the best. Yes, the I best. didn't know you took it. Yes. It's the best. How when do you, you take, take it? it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> take it in the morning, yeah. and I take the uh, Metamucil pills. Oh. You have to take about 20 of them to get full effect. Yeah, that's why but I like the powder. Of the, the powder's of the too psyllium. gritty for me. But psyllium's disgusting. Yeah, yeah. Here's a tip. The benefit's so great. Drink it fast. Got it. Here's what you do. You put a, a bunch of psyllium in a shake bottle. Yeah. Add water, but don't like move it around. Get everything wet. Mm -hmm. Get as little of it as wet as possible. So you can shake it and then drink it right away. Because if you leave it, that's when it congeals and gets disgusting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you only get Early. like the side yeah. of it wet, yeah. shake it, drink yeah, yeah. it way so it's, it's just easier. like drinking sand as opposed to drinking gelatin that's sand. That's right. Two other things. A little bit of salt makes it taste better. And cold water is a world of dif difference. Oh, so there you go, buddy. Silly um, and uh, it's great. This is now irritable bowel talk. This Welcome is, to IBS. Is, Nadav, and, uh, I'm assuming this is pertinent to you. And uh, Christina. <laughs> what? what? No, no, no. It's, it's pertinent to Christina, but she is not allowed to touch this stuff because it will ruin everything at your mom's house. That's you true. She will yeah, not you shart no. and she won't produce so much gas. Wait, psyllium bad. husk prevents the farts? It, it will, yeah, it'll it, it will reduce the there, farts yeah. potentially and eliminate the sharts. Psyllium husk. I'll make sure that Christina doesn't take best. any. Yeah, please. I mean, you, I, you, I want to think of Metamucil like out on the counter here with a big, with a big no parking thing through it, a big red, <laughs> red which is my next T-shirt. Oh, can my <laughs> clip of me explaining why Christina farting is funnier than Tom farting be a clip on your mom's house? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we could, we could definitely present. Oh, one hundred percent. Agree. And then oh, can they, you say how could they not agree? Comedy that? Sex God is available for pre-order. Yes, right Comedy you got Sex it. God. Ah. Okay, uh, let's hear some uh, voice messages, shall we? Let's hear what we got. Hey, Dr. Drew. Uh, I'm love here. the uh, new podcast. I uh, grew up listening to Love Line. Uh, I'm a 30 years old now, um, and my problem is I think I contracted herpes uh -oh. downstairs. Mm -hmm. I got cold sores when I was young, and uh, I've been tested, and I don't come up for H2, but I'm scared to hook up with girls at this point. Okay. So um, if you have any advice. Okay, stop him. This is a really interesting question. Okay, so he probably has HSV-1, and I, I'm not sure how to coach anybody about this these days because this stuff is so common. The data suggests it's almost like ubiquitous. Everyone has something on their mouth. Everyone? Pretty much. I mean, it's extremely common to have something, either her herpes-1 or even herpes-2 or about like 20% in the mouth. And if you're engaging in oral sex, you could potentially transmit it that way. So even though he's worried about downstairs, I mean, there's still... You might get it in your mouth. Yeah. And and if he wore a condom, here's 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 what I'm getting kind of... I haven't done this work in a long time, so here, I'm, people need to coach me up. If he wore a condom and he took Valtrex or Zorax, which will pr reduce the risk of transmission genitally like 96%. Oh, wow. So he can use a condom and take Valtrex or Zorax and really, really reduce the I risk of transmission. I just pictured the herpes in his balls like a like an army platoon being like, we still have a 4% chance, guys. <laughs> right. Let's get out there. Get out Think there positive. <laughs> but, but I'm not sure how to coach people up on the mouth because no one uses dental dams or anything. No one just, no one does that. No. So I, I think the thing... What, what, how bad is it to get it in your mouth? Every, everyone's got it. That's how no, bad it so is. Yeah, it's no big deal. But you can transmit it genitally and that's when people start to freak out. Because and, it's unattractive? This is why... It could I, lead because, to cancer because, later? No, no, it cannot. Infertility? No. It's just that you can transmit it to other people. Just more and herpes. It, and it can be painful. Yeah. It, it's just not and something gross. you want to you want to expose somebody else to. Right. Right. It's so I, I, no, I, I So I think that. That, I think the key is to wear a condom, take the antiviral medicine, get that from your doctor, and then uh, just be honest. And then people kinda have to assess their own risk. 
Isn't it interesting right? that we have all these biological things forcing us to be honest in our sexuality, which is like something we should be doing anyway? Yes. It's like it's like the biological response to a psychological deficiency. Yes. <laughs> like you should be more honest and we're not doing it. So yes. it's like, uh, here's a thing that's going to force you to communicate before you have sex. Yeah. Interesting. And, <laughs> and maybe to be more discerning with who you, who you yeah. partner up. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Next. Hey, Dr. Drew. Uh, my name is Nicole. I'm calling in from Connecticut and really 1%, hoping you can help me resolve this debate okay. on the mystery of squirting. Uh -oh. uh, my husband, myself, and some of our friends have had about a month-long discussion about it. Oh, God. And we still it's really can't fine. come to a conclusion. Throw yourself is in a ravine is the conclusion. <laughs> real thing, first of all. Is it urine? Is it actual cum? Is it a combination of the both? Can it be learned? Or are you naturally born with this amazing ability? We okay. have to know. Please answer our question. Thank okay. See, this, How boring is Connecticut? I think this woman... That you're talking about this for a month. This is a, this is a cool... Give it a Google. She's a cool gal married to a cool guy. Get the fuck out of my fucking face with this fucking question. Well, I'm going to answer it. May I? I'm going to answer it. Go ahead. Squirting's a real thing, but clearly you can learn it because girls in porn are definitely putting something in there and contracting and shooting Well, that's it urine. Out. That's urine. That's they urine. Do in porn. Yeah. And, and it's urine? Always? I thought they could well, in porn. use a baster and just put anything in there. Right. So now, you're, yeah, you right. So urine. Uh, is, You'll notice that this conversation is going to take less than there's, a month. There's something called fe female orgasmic incontinence, right? And that's urine. Some people mistake that for squirting. Some people feel like it's squirting. We're, we, don't, we do not judge. Uh huh. Uh, actual. Female ejaculate is usually a thicker material. It's usually something that just some people do and not everybody does. And it's just one of those God-given traits. And there are people out there that claim you can sort of train somebody through stimulating certain tissue, uh, the, the floor of the vagina or the roof of the vagina. I, I'm not so convinced of it. Urologists have looked at it. They look at it mostly as urine, but there are clearly people that have something else going on. And, and women that uh, I, I've over the years interviewed who do have this magical trait, uh, they will often say sometimes it's it's separate from orgasmic function even. It's oh, really? Really long with it, yeah. So, hmm. so there you go. That's our answer. Do we have any more? Of yeah, it's a it's a rumor started. I, I by knew we'd get Pete the rubber uh, sheet upset. company. We'd get Pete upset before it's. I all just over. bothered me that people spent more than one night talking about that. A month, thirty days. Cool dude. How boring is life? Mm -hmm. You're like, all right, day twenty. They think you're. Boring. Could it be P talking about all that spiritual gobbledygook? Mm, that's true. I'm in. I'm into soul squirting. <laughs> Enough said. Uh, do you have any more voicemails up there? I, yeah, I really. Hey, could, do we? Do can we take uh, calls? Are we going to be able to do that one day? Yeah, we're gonna it, take some figuring out on our end, but we'll try and do that. At I some mean, just think if we could have talked to that young lady, this would have been very interesting. So I let's. Mean, we have a, her phone number. We could definitely do a follow up. You know, if you're going to drive an hour here, you might as well have a fucking phone line. Do you want to follow up? Pete wants to follow <laughs> up with this lady. <laughs> I just like being pretend mad at the booth. <laughs> I'm not really mad, Booth. Okay. I am mad. But let's do follow 30, up with her. We should. 30 days. Sure, okay. okay. Next voicemail. Hey, Dr. Drew. This is George calling from Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. I had a question regarding semen. Uh, I have no problems like Josh Potter. I can finish uh, with women. However, my semen does not seem to shoot out, as see, you see in a lot of pornography more, and more it sort of dribbles time. out. This is, um, this has kind of been something that's, that I've dealt with my, my whole life, and it doesn't really affect my sexual life. But of course, I would like to uh, shoot long strings of semen if there's any Ropey way to possibly streams. Uh, treat my condition. This right, is a Tuck porn will be terrific society. From you. I'm a huge fan. Thank you very much. Porn Bye -bye. has changed the world. This oh, dude oh, from Santa Barbara it going has. like, yeah. you know what? What uh, people in like the Middle Ages called a drip, drip, cum shot? Yeah. A cum shot. Yeah. They were just like, I dribbled. Yeah. They didn't even talk about it. Now this guy's watching Peter North blast radius He's videos. He's talking about what condition his condition is in. So, uh, But I get it. All right. <laughs> you can do Kegel exercises. You can drink lots of fluids, but uh, just don't even. Believe me, it, it's not worth your time or effort. That That's just something. As something. someone who blasts thick, ropey streams. Uh, that, like there's Dr. something called, see, pe people have, uh, let's talk about a little physiology for a second. Which is that I just thought of somebody I got to get for the show. Wouldn't it be more virile though? Like, isn't it like, could it be a testosterone thing? Because isn't semen that shot out more a better chance at making a baby? Not necessarily. We yeah. already produce plenty. Uh, and here's the deal: a the dribble, dribble. Semen are just is just stored fluid in the seminal vesicles uh -huh. produced by the prostate. 
Yeah. That's it. Uh-huh. The the testicles are dripping in sperm into those seminal vesicles, and the f- amount of the, how big your vesicles are is how much fluid you 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 know you put there. Right. And that's what comes out. But what what and controls the, the force? The, how the many muscle, times muscle, you move the, pel- the pelvic the super muscle. shaker? Pelvic. <laughs> The super soaker. You got to pump it more. I understand. Pelvic, pelvic musculature. Get more pressure. Pelvic musculature. But do, you don't think the, the, the blast no. determines? No. I it, mean, but just on a very physical... Like, I, I understand you. Yeah. It, it makes intuitive sense, but it doesn't matter. Really? Yeah. It does not matter. But I mean, when they talk about women that want to get pregnant after the guy comes, they, they'll put their legs back. And yeah, and there's not actually... That doesn't well, work. Well, people do that. It's not necessarily... But the, sper- the sperm just gets in, in it, the it has area a, the and the it whole starts issue. the hike. Yeah, how it gets Wouldn't in. Wouldn't it through. like a blast? But let's start it, over. Let's start in California me, instead of yeah, Massachusetts. So hold on a second. I'm going to draw you a picture of a vagina and where the cervix is. I'm going to keep it. So if this is a vagina, the cervix sort of sits down like that. I know where the it's cervix is. It's sort of is. sort of back. <laughs> uh-huh. And so stuff kind of has to kind of trickle back in here anyway. Drew, make sure to show everyone no, at home, it's, it's too. No, it's too pathetic. No, I like it. It's, but again, here, here's our caller, and he's just going blue. <laughs> and here's gravity. So the woman stands up, and here goes his gene pool. And think about and it. And this how, is me. Pow pow! Think of Whoa! And that's why I have a baby. You guys got pregnant pretty fast. Yeah, fucking it, we did. And, and uh, that's because I do kegels. But uh, I, even though when a woman stands back up, all that fluid tends to generally come out. Yeah. It doesn't reduce the risk of pregnancy. Yeah. Okay. okay. But okay. Do you have more voice messages? Think you, I think Pete likes this. We sure do. Okay, one Yeah, more. we got tons more. Okay, go ahead. No phone line, though. Hey, no Dr. Drew. Uh, my name is Roy, and I got out of a emotionally abusive relationship that I was in for about two years. We've been apart for about six months. Um, I still see her at church where we both went, but we were together in a relationship for two years, and she was emotionally abusive to me. And I've forgiven her, we've, we've, we've broken up, and, and um, I've been able to move on for the most part, but I still struggle with sexual desire for her. And I'm, I'm, that's the one thing that I'm struggling okay. right, to get right. over. So, 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 by the way, did you notice I put a tie on for you? I know you're such a religious oh, guy. I thought I like, like going to church. Like, I thought you always dress like that. You're a sharp I do, I do stuff during the day where I have to dress like this sometimes, but I thought I'll leave this on for Pete. It would be good. weird if you were in a t-shirt. You're Dr. Drew. But I wear a t-shirt here all the time, don't I? Usually? Yeah, Does confirmed. Okay. okay, confirmed. I, I've affirmative. Been, I've been where this guy is. Me in there said affirmative. That me said that. <laughs> well, this me sounds like real me because I was in a relationship like that was very attractive. Well, that's why I want to say I want to get in that with you because it's a common thing. Like for men, it turns out men experience love at first sight way more than women. Mm. Way more. And it's built on, it's really lust at first sight that works out. Mm. But for us, that's an important motivator. And if our particular- I say that to Valerie all the time, I'm like, what are the chances that the person I needed and that would be my person was in the packaging that I also desired? Right. It's wonderful when that works out. Right. When it works out. <laughs> exactly. And, and if the numbers don't match, the guy tends to cling to the higher number female. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Like she's like out of his league a little bit. Oh, that's mine. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And that's his too. Yeah, I'm sure. And, it and is. so it's like, oh, I'm never going to get that again. I'm never going to have this again. I, I got to have that. Back. And I bet she said that to him. If I know emotional abuse, I bet you said yeah, you'll yeah, never yeah. have something so, like this. So what again. do you do? These well, things. if his question is, should I stop going to this church? The answer is, you're only asking because you know absolutely you should stop going to right. that church. Right. So he needs he needs to what not he needs to not. Expose you're an addict. Him. He's an addict. He's addicted to her. It's exactly yes. right. It's a great way get to get out of there. How did you get over it? I. You know, it's funny, dude. This is hilarious. I used to tell Valerie all the time that I had this abusive relationship, and it took me ten tries to break up with her because I was this terrified. Is, this of her. is before your marriage. Before my marriage, yeah. yeah. But we still talk about a track record with relationships, my friend. What do you mean? Nothing. (laughs) How dare you? How dare me? So I was scared of her. How dare me? And she was very powerful and very sexy. And it took 10 tries to break up. And finally we broke up. Just how old are you then? Uh, 30, 32. Oh my. So this was this between marriages? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, was this like the one in the in the in the season three? So it's like the chicken crashing. Similar. Yeah. Oh man, that that chick in the street. Yeah, that's it. That's that an the, emotionally abusive. That was the best yeah. version of that I've ever seen. I really on appreciate that. Yeah, I've gotten that a lot. I'm proud yeah. to say because I was trying to. It made show... me worry about the actress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that's oh, so funny because oh, she's so good. Yeah. Well, she's a wonderful yeah. actress. I'll yeah. say that. Uh, Madeline Wise is her name. So I I wanted to dramatize that. So that's what Crashing Season Three is about. Is yeah. is an infatuation and an addictive yeah. codependent yeah. relationship. Um, and people who know that have been in that know from the first time Pete, my character, meets her, like 
he's fucked. He's, he's completely he's out of his I, It's league. exactly what my reaction was. Yeah. Some people were like, this is great. He's finally found oh, love. No, and I was I like, oh, like, you oh, haven't oh, been around yeah. the block yet. I That's, just, yeah, just the magic of the borderline. Is right. What I saw. Exa- well, that's what that was what it was a borderline personality yeah. for yeah. sure. Um, I said to Val, I was like, I broke up with her. And then that, that was it. I'm out. I don't want to see her. The truth is, and when I look back on, e- I was reading old emails, like trying to remember what it was like to be in that place. And I realized that I did hang out with her two or three times after course, we broke up because she insisted on it. Well, Borderlands can't deal with abandonment. Yeah. She they can't re- deal with yeah. loss. So she really to wanted to have in. all of these and, exit and you portray- interviews. That was in the crash. It's in it. the, yeah, that, that portrayed in the, I we had, it. we had an exit interview, mm-hmm. her idea, terrifying idea. So I changed the past in my mind that I was like, I broke up with her and that was it because yeah. I knew I couldn't handle it. The truth was, and I should have more compassion for people like yeah. this, is I wasn't strong enough to just say it's over, it's over, it's yeah. over. We had two or three exit interviews and then it was over. Yeah. But you got, I moved, I moved neighborhoods. I, I, I good. I deleted it on Facebook. You, I had to, yeah, you yeah. have to. It's, you have to get abstinent. And my therapist was just like, he said something I thought was very loving to me. He was like, Pete, uh, maybe that'll just be a sexual fantasy you have for the rest of your life. It'll be something that you remember fondly as like a fling, like go ahead and allow that, but you can't, yeah. you can't have that. Right. What, what some therapists will tell patients is, is just, you have a choice. Do you want to have that sexual gratification and live in misery? That's right. Or would you like to find a healthy relationship? And there's, can satisfying. I tell you, there's a million, dude, you're, you're, you're still in the middle of your tunneling out of a prison. Yeah. You're yes. not out yet. So yes. like, don't turn back because the world is filled with what I, what I call sad dads. You see these very small emasculated men and women, it goes both ways, mm. that made the weaker choice, that mm. they went with their infatuation, they went back to their mm. addiction, and you see these men and their shadows and their mm. Xeroxes of Xeroxes of Xeroxes of who they used to be, and they're quiet and they're broken, mm. and the world is filled with them. And my heart breaks for the sad dads. I used to have a bit about it. I was like, well, see I you want, next week. Want to make a, with that, we'll leave, we'll leave I want to, that thought. No, I want to make a camp for sad dads. This guy's funny. This guy's where, funny. Where, you they get get, it? where they can have uh, Bob Seger records and then play mini golf and eat, and eat wings. What I'm saying is keep going. You're yes. playing with fire. It's not a get fucking joke. It's your yeah. life. Change churches. Get off, get her off Facebook. Love yourself enough to be brave enough to know that there is a better future, yes. but you great, need to make yourself advice. available great to advice. us. I feel like, nah, what do you call him? Nah? Huh? Nadav, you call him nah? Oh, I call him nah, Nadav or nah. Nah, nah. nah is good. Uh, nah has got something else lined up for us. Seems All like. right, nah. Our last voicemail. Here we we didn't even listen to the end of that. It doesn't matter. We didn't need to. We didn't need to. Is there another? Yeah, here it comes. Hey, Dr. Drew. Is this I've the been girl? watching your podcast. I was wondering, why is it when I drink alcohol, mm-hmm. particularly um, vodka, <laughs> of my drink of choice, I was wondering why my pH level gets so thrown off for about a week after. Literally, it's like like BV, bacterial vaginosis, like right. instantly um, my whole body chemistry is just off for about a week afterwards. I've since joined um, AA. Um, I'm going to filth now. <laughs> but um, and like she the book, to they say refer things. to alcohol as being an allergy to some people. Yeah. And I was wondering if that is true at all. Okay. And- so Wait, there, did, we, did we already yeah, cover this question? No, not like this. Okay. So she is an alcoholic. She's not describing having a couple shots of vodka she's describing blacking out and having consequence from alcohol and her whole body is thrown up because she's in alcohol withdrawal mm. the rest of the week and yes it can last for several days and it has nothing to do with ph please please stop that nonsense uh but it does have to do with your immune function uh and so your immune function in, in the vaginal environment she's talking about developing a vaginal bacterial vaginosis she said bv and so the vaginal environment is very sensitive for some women and almost anything can throw it off where they get other discharges and symptoms. Uh, and certainly heavy, heavy alcohol can do that. So <laughs> I'm going to bet you also use, you know, people use a lot of medicines around heavy drinking too. They take Pepsi, they take Tylenol, they take all these other things. And I bet, I, I'm suspicious that may have as much to do with this as uh, the alcohol itself. Ooh, what's so, that called in your field? What? If I was another doctor, I'd go, oh, uh, Dr. Drew, good thinking. <laughs> good. It'd uh, be something. Good deductive thing. Good, good, deductive, good, uh, good yeah. clinical reasoning. Clinical yeah, reasoning. good clinical reasoning. Because you didn't say it, but you were like, I bet that's good. That's a good doctor. Mm-hmm. That is a good okay. doctor. Stuff. I do want to remember, I love plugging this book because it changed my life. What book? It's called This Naked Mind, oh, How yeah. to Control Alcohol. I thought you were talking about Comedy Sex Guide. 
Well, I, I want people love, to read you my love book. Plug, you love plugging that. I book. also, Michael Gunger's This is a great book and Comedy Sex God is a great book, but uh, I hope. But This Naked Mind as an audio book in particular, I, I can't, every day I get a, twi- okay. a tweet or an Instagram yeah. message. People oh. say, what is the book that you read that helped you get off alcohol? Because there's so many people that, like me, uh, weren't sure if they were alcoholics or not. Well, you never got all the way in. You know what I mean? If you if you are all the way into alcoholism, you need to do treatment. You right. Do some formal. But well, if that's you're, why if I like struggling. sharing my story. I it wasn't it wasn't what I call like a sexy drunk. This, it was, it, this, this naked, naked mind. mind. Yep. Yeah. By Annie Grace is her. I mean, you got the gene, right? You got the gene. From I got dad. the gene from everybody. And, and then, oh, your mom too. I think so. And, everybody. And then. And then, uh, and then you activated it, but you didn't fully throw the switch. I just, I, to quote Robin Williams, I wasn't waking up on the hood of my car with, the, with my keys in, the, in my ass. You right. know, it wasn't like right. that. But and I was... They were just was, in your hand, not in your ass. <laughs> I was just habitually drinking every day. Yeah, I yeah. just couldn't yeah. not do it. Mm-hmm. And I realized that at one tiny point, I won't go on for a long time about this, that alcohol is sold to us as this thing of freedom. Oh. And sometimes it's the exact opposite. Oh. It's sold to you as freedom and yeah. agency and power. And really it's taking your freedom, your agency and your power. And that's what that book helped me realize. It's not like guilting you. It's not even telling you about your liver or anything. It's just telling you that you were sold a lie. And that that uh, empowered me to just go like, I think I'm gonna stop and I did. It's Good. been over a year. It, it takes you, what, different things speak to different people. It's finding that thing that speaks and to And I liked that, yeah. So I like to plug it when I can. Speaking of plugs, uh, are we wrapping up? We're not gonna watch clips? Yeah, we can do a clip. All right, let's do a clip before we wrap up. This uh, is some uh, another cool dude, Pete. Another cool dude. Yeah. I want to see a cool dude. Yeah. Right. So a little setup is that we talked a little bit about uh, you know narcissism earlier in the episode, and so you know a lot of people on Twitter they like to you know what the kids call flexing, and so you know they're, they're just kind of telling everyone what they got, what everyone else doesn't have, and on episode four ninety one of your mom's house. We found Michael Daddy Fifty One. Cool dude. We, yeah, he's actually he's the pioneer of the rich guy club instead oh. of the cool guy club. Oh, talk to I me mean, if in need fun. of sugar yeah, I daddy. That, I love man. that it's still in the withdrawal envelope. Come wax my head, it gets me horny. Peace, oh, peace out. Wow. I will suck the fart out of your ass. Is that is that for Christina specifically? It has a thousand I, likes. Yeah, I already like that. A thousand that. likes. Go ahead and undo that like, please. Yeah. God told me they aren't worth shit. Oh, what? This guy is a cool dude. And hold on. We got a couple ready on standby. Okay. Uh, a picture of me and my kids. Oh, God. Is that his cum? Oh, my God. <laughs> so here's the deal, Pete. That dude is blowing we, ropey streams. We can't do a show without me putting my hands over my face. <laughs> They Are do, you allowed to do that? They do something where it makes me want to hide every freaking show. And so I'm so ashamed. And uh, now I'm... How I'm many there. likes does that have? I'm, I don't want to know. Ugh. 2,723. Oh, my God. People are retweeting that. They want others to see it. This guy it. has 90,000 followers. Yeah. Well, he's a, you guys created this. When nah, you, he was big before we got to him. When you yeah. hustle like me, you got to have five phones. Two of those, dude, are fucking... Classic s- flex, right? What's what? Why do people flex like this, Drew? Flex meaning show their goods? Just show, showing off when no one's really asking them to. They're just being like, you know, I got all these phones to, you know, call your lady. You know, <laughs> this just says... You know, it, it seems to me that... Please love me. Yeah, it, I, I get sad when I see guys Please like pick this. me up. However... Mommy, pick me up, please. Yeah. Why things, isn't mommy looking at me? Things like that, exactly. Big booby bitches hit me up. I got tax money to spend. <laughs> please, mommy, pick me up. Why doesn't she see me? Yeah. And so I get sad like you. I get sad I get with sad these guys. Too. However, if you're going to go even a little bit this way... Mm-hmm. You might as well go all the way. So you got to respect him for that. There's a part of me that does yeah. respect him. I'm yeah. like, at least you're just being, you're owning you're, your. You're your really going all the way. Oh, here he is with his rolled up bills again. Ten thousand dollars. Wow. Got to show you, broke bitches. I'm still on top. Oh, where is your wound? And he looks like Santa Claus too. In what a? Way. I, I mean, like I, I bet don't... he plays Santa Claus. I bet he does Santa Claus. I don't think oh, so. Oh yes, yeah, somehow. Not with those of... hands. Yeah, look at that. So didn't somebody somewhere put a beard on that guy? Staring into your bitch's soul before I dive in. Wow. It's actually pretty hilarious. It is funny, isn't it? I was just thinking, this guy's a... I take my dentures to eat that pussy real good. I take out my dentures. Uh, he's funny. I mean, maybe he knows he's being hilarious. I don't, the level I don't of know. commitment is uh, su- substantial. Yeah. What did Tom think about him? 
Oh, Tom Tom loves this guy. I mean, we all love this guy, don't you? No. Oh, why why don't you? Uh, cuz he makes me sad, but you know. I don't uh, but I appreciate him. More about that. What about him specifically makes you sad? I mean, uh, we just look at Pete and I look at him and we like Pete was saying, "Mommy, pick me up." That's what we see. We see what's really going on here. Oh, what's this? He's getting that's, heavy. That's that's what for? He's have a heart attack? Pussy overdose. Jesus Christ. What is the matter with this guy? What is the matter with this guy? Uh, yeah. Peace out, man. I feel like, you know, he it's might kinda, he kinda, might be I, a, a fun on a road trip. I, I Yeah, I, I kind of respect the funny. I, I respect, respect the funny. Yeah. I think I think he might know what he's doing. But he, I there's also, you know, it's it's just sort of an exaggeration of what we're all sort of doing. I think yes is is he's going. Please look at me. Please see me. Yes, yes. It's yes. the same thing. Where and so he's using what he has, which is a uh, an overactive libido <laughs> and some cash to and, to and, to peacock a little bit and, and be but, special. But the disdain for women is like beyond. Yeah, Maybe that's the, a little ugly. Yeah. So when the pussy's so good, you turn well, the R word. Is that like him, uh, Vincent Van Gogh, or Monet version of? I mean, he's got Photoshop, what's but maybe his, he does have money. What, what's this guy's name? Michael. Michael Daddy. Michael Daddy Fifty One. Yeah, I think he's still taking sugar babies. Uh, so you could follow him and oh, and he tweet takes at sugar him. babies. Uh, tweet at him. Go ahead and do that. Let's see what we get back. I'd be interested to sort of keep keep abreast of this guy. See how he does. But Pete, I told you I'd take you on a journey today. You did. I, yeah, I'm thinking about this. I'll be thinking about this guy for a long time. I hopefully will not. It's just interesting the things we confuse for, for strength. You know what I mean? Like we don't have a cultural space for like real strength being like, can you share some vulnerability or some honesty or some humility I think I, or some grace? See, this is why I always said women are a, a <laughs> most superior version of the human being because they, they yes. do know that. But unfortunately, we've gone so far now into right. how I feel. We've lost track of logic in this country. Yeah. Like lo logical discourse no longer has any impact on people. That's interesting. And that's kind of weird. But at least that, all right. that money. He's got let's, that cash. Let's wrap it up. Comedy Sex God pre-order on Amazon. Yeah, on Amazon, please. And the podcast. Uh, the podcast is called You Made It Weird. You Made It Weird. Get it wherever you get your podcast. Listen to Dr. Drew. It's a good first episode. You can it was listen a lot to him fun. talk me off of my first dose of Adderall, he was on which Adderall. I did not like. He was a Everyone edgy. likes it. I didn't like it. No, it's not a good thing. For it people. wasn't good. Adults particularly. And uh, as I said, support the people who support the pod. Uh, we really appreciate you all listening. We really appreciate all the enthusiasm for this uh, for this podcast. I need to support over at the Dr. Drew podcast. If you just sort of download that for me and take a listen. It's It's, like I said, a little... Well, it's a, a lot straighter podcast. It's, 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 uh... Is that it? That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See you next time. All conversations and information exchanged during participation of the Dr. Drew After Dark podcast or interaction on the drdrew.com website is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Do not confuse this with treatment or physician medical advice or direction per se. You must always follow your medical professional's advice and direction. Nothing on these podcasts or posted on this site supplements or supersedes the relationship and direction of your medical caretakers. Please understand, I am not playing the role of physician in this environment per se. I'm educating. I am a licensed physician with specialty boards in American Board of Internal Medicine and American Board of Addiction Medicine.